Welcome to worship as we gather today on this Trinity Sunday. A couple announcements to pay attention to in your bulletin today. We want to uh, make our joint board aware that we meet tomorrow night in the Fellowship Hall beginning at 7. There is a uh, Zoom link for those who are unable to attend in person. Also, be aware that our community meal is this Wednesday night beginning at 5. And it's, it's a drive through event, so we look forward to sharing that ministry with you and with each other. Today in the course of our service, you're going to hear about um, some other things that are happening. Um, we're grateful to have Adam Rudisell leading us at the organ today as Kathy's away. He's going to tell us about an event that's going to take place Monday a week, and we're going to hear from Ocean Bryant, who's going on a mission trip this summer. We'll hear about that in just a moment. We're trying to plan a mission trip for folks in our church to be together and do something for others. It'll be in Plymouth, North Carolina, it's planned for the week of July 11th. If you're interested in participating or want to know details, please contact the office this week so we can get out in an idea about how, group, how big the group might be for that particular trip. The other events of uh, the coming weeks are listed in your bulletin uh, for you to review as you go about your life this week. Trinity Sunday is an interesting day because it really officially marks the beginning of summer. It marks the beginning of the season of Pentecost as a, a part of our lectionary, which makes it the longest season of the year. It begins today and runs through the end of Advent. It's sometimes called ordinary time, but there's not really anything ordinary about it. It's how to live with the power of the Holy Spirit, the Pentecost power as a community, as we move forward through the summer months together. Today we explore that as we listen to the words of Jesus from the Last Supper in John 16, beginning at verse 12. With that in mind, let's stand as we begin our worship by praying together the Liturgy for Trinity on page 95.
Spirit of God, we praise and worship you as the one who gave birth to his uh, to Christ's church with the sound of mighty wind and fire. Excuse me. We're on the wrong page, folks. It's not page 95. It's on page 105. 100. <laughs> page 100. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, the whole earth is full of Your glory. You're worthy to receive glory and honor and power. You created all things, and by Your will You brought them forth. To You, the One who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb be praise and honor, glory and might forever and ever. Triune God, we acknowledge the profound mystery of Your being beyond our comprehension, three and one, one and three. Yet what we could never know by ourselves, You have revealed to us through Your Word and Your mighty works, through Christ Jesus Christ and the presence of Your Spirit, You have made Yourself known. You offer the gracious gift of eternal life. Eternal life is to know You, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom You have sent. As we bow before You, holy God, we confess our own holiness and receive Your Word of forgiveness. Let's be seated for prayer. Gracious God, we confess our sin which separates us from You. <clears throat> we know how people who belong to You should live, but we fail to live that way. We have done evil. We have failed to do good. We have lived for self rather than for You or our neighbor. Thus our lives are diminished, our witness is stifled, and Your image in us is tarnished. Forgive us, good Lord, through Jesus Christ, by Your Spirit, guide us to live as people who know and love You. Amen. The Lord who saves you says, I am the God who forgives your sins. I do this because of who I am. I will not hold your sins against you. Let us stand as we sing. Let us love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, and with all our strength. We know God is Father who seeks loving relationships with all whom He has created. Like a mother, God has nurtured us all our days and has been near in time of trouble. Praise the Lord and do not forget how kind God is who forgives our sins and redeems us from the grave, who blesses us with steadfast love and tender mercy, who fills our lives with good things so that our youth is renewed like the eagles. Christ, the Word who became hum a human being and lived among us, full of grace and truth. No one has ever seen God, 
Only the Son, who is one with God and is at the Father's side, he has made God known. God created the whole universe through him and for him. Christ existed before all things, and in union with him all things have their proper place. Jesus was humble and walked the path of obedience all the way to death, even death on the cross. For this reason, God raised him to the highest place above and gave him the name that is greater than any other name. And so, in honor of the name of Jesus, all beings in heaven, on earth, and in the world below will fall on their knees and will openly proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We know God is Holy Spirit, who reveals the truth about God. The world cannot receive the Spirit because it cannot see or know Him. But we know Him because the Spirit remains with us and is in us. God's Spirit joins with our spirits to declare that we are God's children. The Holy Spirit is the Helper who stays with us forever. Because we are God's children, God sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, the Spirit who cries out, Father, my Father. Like a mighty wind, like a blazing fire, the Holy Spirit comes upon us and fills us with power, making us witnesses for Christ to the neighborhood, to the nation, and to the ends of the earth. May you have power to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge and to be filled with all the fullness of God. It is through Christ that all of us are able to come in the one Spirit into the presence of the Father. to God, who, who by God's power within us is able to do far more than we would ever dare to ask or imagine. To God be glory in the church through Jesus Christ forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. Today's scripture passage is John chapter 16, verses 12 through 15, as found in the Common English Bible. I have much more to say to you, but you can't handle it now. However, when the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you in all truth. He won't speak on His own, but will say whatever He hears and will proclaim to you what is to come. He will glorify me because he will take what is mine and proclaim it to you. Everything that the Father has is mine. That's why I said that the Spirit takes what is mine and will proclaim it to you. The Word of God for the people of God.
So I want to invite, I want to, invite Ocean uh, to come up for just a second. And then we'll have our special music. So uh, if uh, you were fortunate when you were college age, you had a chance maybe to go on a mission trip and to do it outside the country. And whenever that happens, it will change your life. And so Ocean's got that opportunity this summer, and we've invited her to come share a little bit about it. Sure. Good morning. Uh, first, first off, I want to uh, say a huge thank you to all of you who have contributed both prayerfully and financially in my ability to travel to Honduras this coming Saturday. I, will not be, I would not have been able to go if it wasn't for all the love and support that you all have given me as a church. Um, for those of you who may be unaware of what I'm going to be doing while over in Honduras, I just got word a couple of weeks ago that I'll be leading a vacation Bible school for kids in Honduras with a group of people um, that's going along with me. Um, the team and I, in the days leading up to our departure, will be, pre will be preparing lessons and fun activities for the kids to do um, to help them understand who Jesus is and all that he has done for us. In addition, I will be given many opportunities throughout the week to share my testimony to those around me and in the hopes to impact someone else who relates to my story um, and let them just see how Jesus has changed my life. Additionally, in the weeks leading up to the uh, to the trip during training, I've been provided with several methods to help me easily guide me in initiating gospel conversations with anyone that I meet, and then been spending a lot of time getting my heart and mind in the right place. Um, there's no question that I am a little bit nervous about going. Um, this is my first time ever going abroad, and so I am a little nervous, but I'm even more excited to see how God is going to move my heart and work through me while I'm over in Honduras. Um, with that said, I ask you all to please continue praying for me as I travel this Saturday and pray that while I'm there, I'm able to make a difference and have a deep impact on all the lives of others And as I share the good news of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Thank you all so, so much. Would you let us do that for you now? I'm going to turn this mic off so there's just one. Let's pray. Lord, in your word this morning, you remind us of your great trinity of love, a love that invites us to abide in you, so that you abide in us, and together we abide in God. And that love becomes something greater than all of us combined. It becomes something so great it can touch lives, it can change lives, it can change us. I pray that you would keep Ocean safe, you would keep her family in the knowledge that she is safe while she's gone, but more importantly, that you would move through her and her team to affect many lives with grace, with love, with peace in your name. And we trust you before we know the outcome. In the name of Jesus, amen. One more announcement or, or sharing, kind of doing this out of order. So uh, we're grateful to have Adam Rudisel. He helps us a lot with music and is a great partner with us. He serves Willa Hill as their music director. He's part of a thing that's going to happen in our community. And I'm gonna, at next Monday night, the 20th, here in the Sanctuary at 7, I'll let you explain it. Good morning, everybody. Um, uh, if you don't know what Voce is, Voce is a choral group that Sandy Beam started back in 2002. Um, me and another guy, uh, Lance Newman, are co-directing the group currently, and I'm also accompanying. So this summer, after a two-year break from singing um, due to COVID, we're going to be offering two different concerts, um, both of which are uh, titled Broadway Our Way, and it will include selections from Phantom of the Opera, Rent, and some other Broadway favorites. Um, we're also going to be featuring music from guest soloists Reagan Amos, uh, Susan Lawrence, and Mike Cheek. Um, the first concert will be here on June 20th at 7 p.m., and the second concert will be at First Baptist Church in Elkin, Monday, July 11th at 7 p.m. Um, both concerts are free to the public, uh, but we will accept donations. Um, we are asking everyone to consider wearing masks um, because we have a couple in the group that are immunocompromised and just and they're going to be wearing masks also as we perform. So um, we hope to see everybody at the concert.
perhaps there's no hymn in our hymnal that best captures the meaning of Trinity than hymn 381, Holy, Holy, Holy. Let's stand as we sing it together. Come, Holy Spirit, and fill our hearts in such a way that we hear your voice, that we can focus in on this passage from John 16, and most importantly, that we can lay aside our distractions, our worries, our fears, to hear your voice. We trust you in Jesus' name. Amen. When we look at the Gospel of John, um, it's interesting, most of the time that we're looking at John, we're reading it perhaps with a mindset that we don't know how the story's going to end. Like, like you would read it uh, during Holy Week in anticipation of Good Friday and then Easter morning. You can read John also as if you know how it turns out that Jesus 
is killed, but then rises from the dead. And all of a sudden, everything that he's saying in John has this deeper meaning when you know what's coming from the voice of a risen Lord. Today, as we move to this first Sunday after Pentecost, you're being invited to read it a whole nother way, a post-Pentecost way. And that's probably how the church really read this mostly, was to look back at what Jesus had said in anticipation of the end, particularly during the last week, and how those words now stand out differently as the church is moving forward after its birth and the coming of the Spirit. And so we hear him saying something very particular about the role of the Spirit and the role of Trinity. But you sort of have to look deep to see it. And yet the whole time in John, especially in chapters 13 through 17, the five chapters that record the Last Supper, Jesus is talking pretty plainly about God responds to us in a trinity of love. And the best way to summarize that is to go all the way back to the first chapter after that beautiful prologue, and he starts meeting the men who become his first disciples. And what does he say? Come abide with me. And then in, he'll say abide with me over 40 times in the Gospel of John. We get up to the Last Supper, and, there, and the line that kind of keeps resurfacing is, Abide in me, and I will abide in you, and the Father will abide in us. And, and he prays in chapter 17, Father, what you've revealed in me, revealed to them, so that the love that you and I have will be in them. There's a trinity in that, how that love works. So what does this love do? That's really the question I, my mind goes to when I'm reading this passage from the vantage point of post-Pentecost. I'm thinking about you, Ocean, as you get ready to do this trip. Okay, Lord, you called me to do it. Can I trust you in a place I've never been, doing something I've never tried? I want you all to think of that right now. Because really every day, no matter how uh, familiar you are with living every day, no matter how many years you've lived on this earth, every day is a new day. It may look like a day you've lived before, uh, there may be another day in June that was just as hot as today, just as humid as today, looks like it, all that stuff, but it really is a new day. You have never lived this day before. And when you think of it that way, a, a deeper spiritual question is, so Lord, what do you want to do today? This is the kind of thing Jesus is answering or preloading in John 16, starting at verse 12. As we listen to him talk to the disciples, and he's sort of talking to God and there's this Trinity thing going on in the conversation. What I would rather tell you is when you embrace that love, it's more of a mystical thing. You sort of understand it by doing it. It's kind of like if you've never been a parent and tomorrow you're going to hold a newborn baby in your arms for the first time, I can explain that till the cows come home. They don't mean nothing, right? Till you're holding that baby. I think the day that changed my life the most, I'm, I'm sure there were days that changed my life a lot, but the one that's most visceral to me was driving back to the church office in Hickory after I became a father for the first time. Everything changed. Everything. And so they're using these words of Jesus he spoke before he died that are still true after his resurrection and even more true after the Pentecost. And I hope you can hear them that when you abide in me and you allow me to abide in you, the presence of God does something new in us collectively. So by embracing that Trinity love, what starts to happen is we start to see the mystery of what God's been up to all along, but just more deeply, more vividly. It's like the difference between going to a movie and just wearing normal glasses. It's supposed to be in 3D and actually getting the 3D glasses and seeing the depth of it. More importantly, God starts to show us that He's been trying to embrace us all along with this love, but I want to be distinctive here, not just any love, agape love, unmerited, unconditional love that you cannot earn. And no matter how awesome it is, you can't pay God back for it. All you can do is live into it. And the more you do, the more this becomes a transformational thing as we move forward. Now here's, here's the rub. So why explain all this? More importantly, why does the church keep forgetting this kind of love? Or how do, why is it you and I don't automatically wake up every morning going, all right, it's another day, guess what we get to do today, or I get to do today? And it's more likely you wake up going, oh yeah, there's that list of stuff. I haven't got it done yet. There's relationships or there's issues, and maybe we'll get them resolved today. Maybe it's another day. 
of struggle in something? Why is it that we don't live automatically out of that love? So I'm going to go to one of my favorite uh, theologians, lay theologians, Bob Goff. Bob Goff is, uh, is actually a retired lawyer that writes a lot of inspirational spiritual writing and in short essays. And I think Frankie Caldwell and I are the biggest Goff, uh, Bob Goff fans in the church, perhaps. And he writes an essay in one of his more recent uh, publications, uh, Dream Big, about something that's the opposite of this Trinity love. And I think we kind of need to go there today to kind of get a gist of what God's calling us to. And of all the things he describes in this essay, it's called the Stockholm Syndrome. Now, for those of us that are younger than 50s, um, you might need a reference point. So that became a big thing back in the 70s. It came from an actual event where a bank was robbed in Stockholm, Sweden. And there was a hostage situation for about five days. And it was resolved. And when they took this guy to court to prosecute him, the strangest thing had happened. The five people who were held hostage kind of fell in love with him. They wanted to defend him as if he was a member of their own family. And they were somehow like a family with each other. That's weird, right? So Stockholm Syndrome is when you defend the very thing that's hurting you. When you begin to love and have affection for or just protection for the very thing that holds you captive. So it can be a person. It can be a behavior. It can be an addiction. It can just be a bad way of doing relationships. And I'm not going to show, ask for a show of hands, but I bet everybody in this room knows somebody that keeps getting into relationships that's just not good for them. And they keep doing it over and over and over here, and every time you see, the next time you see them, you're like, oh, I wonder who they're dating this time, and is it going to end up like it always does? We can always see the other. It's really hard to look at yourself and see the things that you become captive to because they're so, you're so familiar with them, but it's the thing that keeps you from living fully into the love that God intends for you to know. The Stockholm Syndrome is kind of important. And I want to say that the reason it works so effectively that it's not just about doing something different or being something different or thinking something different. It's about all three. That's what makes it problematic. Bob Goff is right when he says you can't fix something when it comes to a bad pattern in your life when you don't understand where it's coming from, what triggers it. When you try to stop something cold turkey, I'm just going to stop eating the way I was eating. I'll lose the weight I want to lose or I'll stop you know, maybe smoking's your thing or, or some other behavior that's simple, but you, you think you can change it. You try to do it cold turkey, and it's super rare that you succeed at that. Why is that? Because you're kind of addicted to the way it is. Looking at Nick, and I'm thinking about uh, when I was growing up and doing band things, great band teachers. I was a, I'm a brass player like Nick. He's trombone. He does a slide. I do valves. And when you're trying to uh, learn music, so sometimes what a teacher gets you to do is learn an instrument that's totally different. Like for me, it was a saxophone. And it's not so that you'll get good at the saxophone that you'll respect music more broadly than just the one thing you're trying to do. So whether it's a guitar or a mandolin, I've tried those. Tuba, I, I can do that. Whatever we're talking about, um, if you'll give it 167 hours of practice and then decide... It's interesting how things will change. Why 167 hours? Because when you hit 168, that's a week. And, you're, and suddenly there's muscle memory and there's a new way of doing it. Now I'll make this more practical if it's dieting or just the way we treat each other. If you'll give it 40 weeks, it, it has a chance to be a habit. That's how hard it is to change the way we sort of wire ourselves. And the reason it's hard is because we have these built-in triggers that, that feed the way we think, the way we, we do being and all that. And a better way to say that is, is, and this is what Jesus was, why he's talking to these disciples is, it's the night before he's going to die. They know something's up. They've already talked about uh, Judas betraying him. All that intrigue is in the middle of this conversation and he's talking these beautiful words that included just a short time before chapter 16, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. But it's a tumultuous moment and he's speaking these beautiful, calm words. I'm glad it was Sam that read them this morning because it calms me down to hear Sam read Scripture. 
calmness. So what gets in the way of us here in these words? Let me suggest to you that you're, you're held, I'm held by one of these three things and possibly all three, just one of them more than the other two or all three. It's either fear or anger or shame. And Jesus knew that about the disciples and He's offering them the alternative. And in the love of the Father, that, that trinity of love that is ours when we let Jesus abide in us and we in Him and, and together in God, and what He means by that is we start acting out the love together like going on a mission trip. We actually do something with it together. Guess what gets kind of dis, uh, dismantled? Shame, fear, anger. You don't have time for it because we're doing something. It's an interesting thing. So um, here's the way Bob Goff described it, and I found this very helpful. Maybe you will too. So Bob had the kind of parents that my dad had, that my, my grandparents that I love very much, uh, who never got rid of much of anything. And in this particular, you know, they grew up and, and they lived during the Depression. They were parents during the Depression. That's how you did things. But at Bob's parents' house, there was a special box that held all the keys they used to have. You get what I'm here, my dad chuckling? Um, you never get rid of stuff, right? So you have these keys. Now, dad's saying that because dad had this awesome job that he worked at this very big plant. I think there was 10,000 employees at one time, and his crew was responsible if you locked your keys in the car. Now, back in the days, particularly 1980s and earlier, when there wasn't a microchip in your car key, now, this is going to shock you, especially if you drove an American-made car. There was only about five combinations of keys. And so over time, people lose so many keys. He had this keychain, looked like gun smoke, you know, the, that, that big, long ring, and it had all these keys on it of lost car keys. So you call Dad or somebody on his crew, they come out to your car, and they just start going through the keys, and one of them would unlock your car. That's comforting, but also scary. Well, Bob Goff's parents were like that. They never got rid of any of the keys, even though in some cases they didn't need them anymore. Well, here's what I'm saying. It's what Bob Goff is saying. Those habits that you cling to so tightly with Stockholm Syndrome, the ones that you know are bad for you, but they're so familiar you just don't want to get rid of them. They're, they're the way you think about other people. They're the way you think of anything other than with unconditional love or like a box of keys. What are they good for? Nothing. They, they might be, they could be, they should be, but they're not. And yet we have that box of keys, metaphorically speaking, and Jesus is offering us something different, something new. Now I say that, but I kind of admire that part of my grandparents, that whether it was the box of keys or something else that they had, because I, I held out hope that one day it would be, hold on to it, because you never know, we could use it somewhere down the road. That's actually a good thing. I want you to think about yourself in the way that Ocean has said yes to God. Because she ain't the only one that's called. Every single one of you are called to something. And you don't even have to go to Honduras to do something very difficult. It may be your neighbor. And, and Stan, I'm, not that we got issues or nothing, but you know, Stan's a great neighbor. You may be called upon this week to love or receive love from somebody. But what gets in the way? So I want you to think about Fear, I want you to think about anger. I want you to think about shame and how they get in the way. So I'm going to give you three living examples. So Moses is the first one. Remember the whole conversation of Moses and God at the burning bush? What was Moses' big barrier? He was afraid. We kind of assume he had a speech impediment, something that, that gave him an inability to stand in front of big groups of people and speak for everybody. And the Lord said, you had to prove with Moses, I don't call people that are equipped to do what I call you to do. I equip you after you say yes. If you're, if you're waiting to say yes to God when you finally feel like you got it together, you're going down the wrong road. Because God's going to look for you to say yes first and then empower you. And Moses becomes a great leader because he allowed God to do that. But if you personally knew Moses, he would tell you he was constantly afraid. He had to fight fear all the time, but he did. Thank God he did. Move to the New Testament. When it comes to anger, who stands out to you? The person that stands out to me is Paul. And early in Paul's life, when he's working for the high priest and 
the FBI version of the Temple Guard, um, you know, he's pretty, he was pretty public about how driven by vengeance and anger he was. He killed people because he thought Christianity was against the right way that God wanted. And God changed him. But in order for God to use Paul, his anger had to be transformed. He had to let go of it. He constantly writes about the grace of God like no one else in human history because God set him free of his anger. And God can do that for you. The third one, I'm going to go outside of Scripture into our own history. One of the, uh, we need to sing her praises more is Anna Nitschman. Anna Nitschman lived during the renewal of the Moravian Church in the 1720s and forward. And back then, after that big Pentecost came across our church, we were all divided into small groups that we, we would worship with every day and pray with and study with. And we divided those by gender, by age, and by relative marital status. So if you're in a group of women, it was led by a woman. If you're a group of men, it was led by men. So the elders board, they called it the helper board, was made up of those small group leaders. Anna Nitschman wasn't even 20 years old when she was part of what we now call the Provincial Elders Conference, the helper conference that oversaw the whole Moravian unity. She's not even 20 yet. Can you imagine the sh not the shame part that you would traditionally think about shame, but the I'm not good enough, I'm not prepared for this, you need to pick somebody else because it's not me, that she had to deal with all the time. And then probably a bunch of men saying, you're a woman, you can't do this. Scripture says, you know, they love to quote 1 Timothy and not quote Galatians. Galatians says, in Christ we are one, no longer slave nor free, male nor female, we are one. Acts says, I'll pour out my Holy Spirit on everybody, my daughters and my sons. We love to quote that one scripture in 1 Timothy. Another story for another time. Imagine what Anna had to go through. And in her own lifetime, not only was she equivalent to an ordained pastor, but an ordained, a consecrated bishop of the Moravian Church. She was integral to the mission work that we became famous for. But if she had given in to her, not so much the shame part, but the underside of shame that makes you feel worth less than, where would we be? Thank God for Moses. Thank God for Paul. Thank God for Anna Nitschman. So what's the fix for dealing with fear and anger and shame? Is to allow God's love and Jesus to abide in me and I and it and, and God in us, me and Jesus together. It's, it's the same thing for us corporately that we try to create spaces where collectively we come together. We're going to do that minute in Sunday school where we are trying to abide together in Jesus and Jesus in us and in us with God together. That means to go out and do something together. But we would rather choose just to be the way we are than change most of the time. The thing about fear and anger and shame is you can't sweep them under the carpet. I was spending part of my day yesterday, our middle son's moving back into the area. He's moving into uh, a friend's old farmhouse, and they, he, he's really good at doing the Tom Sawyer thing. When you need to paint something, you just get all your buddies to show up and have a good time and paint it together. They, and they've already painted. It's awesome. But there's this beautiful wood floor just like this. So yesterday he was painstakingly trying to get all the paint up that dripped from all the other stuff, all that help that he had the last time they were all together. And it was very painstaking, but they did it. You can't just sweep that under the carpet. You can't just let the paint stay there. It's got to get cleaned up, right? That's not what we do with our lives. We often try to sweep the anger, the shame, all that stuff away as if it can hide in the corner under something. Jesus teaches us when we do that, the things that we hide often multiply. It's as if we did have that key box that doesn't work for anything anymore, and we just kind of put it somewhere in the back of a closet, and they, they sort of start to metastasize and grow like one mice becomes many mice. That's why we need to claim that love every day. But it's not the Spirit's job for you to know what your triggers are. It's yours. You've got to spend time figuring out what makes you angry, what makes you afraid, what makes you feel less than. That's yours to deal with. But whatever it is, the Spirit has the power to help you do something with it. The same thing's true when we're trying to do something together, collectively. And Jesus says the overall goal 
is that His love would come to life in us more and more and more. Not just you personally, but us collectively. Not just Grace Moravian collectively, but all Christians in Mount Airy collectively. Not just Surrey County, but the whole world. Because He said, when you do that, people see who you really are. You're My people. He said, when you really do that, that love changes everything. And the love that is in you right now becomes something that blesses everyone. Trinity is a funky Sunday because that's one a five-year-old has a hard time comprehending what you're talking about. But even our children and even our pets understand love. You can't fake that. It is what it is. So here's my encouragement for you this week. Choose love. As we go in prayer together, we continue to pray for folks on our list. There's a number that are there that we've been praying for very much this week. We continue to pray especially for Tommy Pendleton and Jerry Pendleton. Uh, Tommy had a procedure this week in Charlotte um, to change the, the uh, pacemaker to a defibrillator that she had. Uh, she received a couple weeks ago. Uh, he, she has struggled with COVID. So has Jerry during the middle of the week. And, and so we continue to pray for them. We also pray for uh, Gata Strauss's um, uh, daughter-in-law who has contracted COVID. Let's pray. Lord, we pray your blessings this day on all those for whom we've been praying. We mention them by name, trusting that in such a moment as this, you might give us uh, the inspiration to put hands and feet on those for whom we pray. For Patsy Pike and Bernie Epperson, for Jerry and Tommy Pendleton, for John Holt, for Charlie Hall, for Ed O'Connor, for Lavinia McMillan, Betty Epperson and Susan Hyatt, for Polly Holder, for Gary Pruitt, for Susan Strauss and Rob Davis, Doris Scott and Robbie Nations, for Jacob Brown, for Eddie Weevil, Shelby Hunter, Marlon Mabe, Dale Baker and Fred Yates, Sam Moser, Greg Moore, for Sam Smith, Danny Strauss, we pray your blessings on them. Creator God, you sent the Holy Spirit to enlighten our hearts. We pray now that you would open our hearts and minds and they would be open more fully. We pray that you would give to us today the things that we need to serve you well this week. We pray, Lord, that you would continue to bless the church in all of its forms and all the places around the world that it exists. We pray for our families, our friends, our neighbors, our co-workers. We pray for this nation, the United States of America, for our president and all officials of our government, national, state, and local. We pray for the problems we all have and for he or she who has the tremendous problem of not having any at all. We pray for the one among us who needs our help the most and for the one who thinks he or she needs it the least, for the most courageous and for the most cowardly, we pray for each other that we may find in you what you want for us the most, our true selves, our authentic happiness. Almighty and ever-living God, direct our thoughts and actions according to your good pleasure, that in the name of your beloved Son we may abound in doing good this week. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Let's stand as we sing together our concluding hymn today, hymn number 661.
church I grew up in, often on a Sunday during the benediction, the pastor would speak those great words from Ephesians 3.20. They're at the end of our liturgy earlier this morning. Hear these words. Trust these words. They are true and they are personal for you. Now to Him who is able to do in you far more than you would ever dare to dream or ask, be all glory, majesty, dominion, and power both now and forever. Amen.